Well, thanks for coming to what is now, I think, our fourth annual YouTubers panel. And uh, we have, uh, I probably don't need to introduce any of these people, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, starting us off all the way on the uh, right side of the stage, we have Kate Fox from Macintosh Librarian. We have Veronica from Veronica Explains, Matt from Polymat. We have Matt D'Amico from Retrobits. Uh, trying to hide his face from me is David Murray from 8-Bit Guy. <laughs> Ken from Computer Clan, we have Sean from Action Retro, Adrian Black from Adrian's Digital Basement, and of course, Taylor and Amy from the Taylor and Amy Show. <laughs> so I'd like to start off with just a, a couple of questions, um, just to kind of warm up everybody, and then uh, you know, after a certain amount of time, we'll go ahead and take questions from the audience. Uh, when you want to ask a question, when it's time, please line up behind that question and answer mic so that everyone will be able to hear you. Uh, and actually, my first question is inspired uh, by Kate. This is your first time on Hi. our panel. Awesome. I'm is this first. your first time at our show as yes, well? Yes, this is the first time. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, my question is inspired by Kate because you, uh, your channel has done a fantastic job of evoking this kind of uh, PBS, Magic School Bus, uh, you know what vibe I'm going for Yes. Here. This uh, kind of educational vibe. And it reminds me a lot of when I was learning about computers in my youth. And I figure we have uh, decades and decades of, of people here who grew up with computers. What are your earliest memories of computers in popular media, like, me like movies and TV shows? And did they help or hurt your perception <laughs> of computing? Uh, and anyone can jump in at right. any time. In media, that's a good question. I think my first, and definitely movies and like computer that wore tennis shoes, things like that, Johnny Five, you know, he's alive, like kind of that, especially uh, Short Circuit that spoke to me when I was very little because I really wanted a robot that I could talk to. And, you know, the computers that I had, you know, the Macintosh, yeah, you could kind of talk to it, but not really, especially back then. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my, I guess, computers and media, was computer that were tennis shoes and short circuit. I'm gonna go with uh, Star Trek IV with the yeah. computer. <laughs> oh yeah. Clarissa explains it all. <laughs> Give it up. I would say uh, probably the earliest one I remember off the top of my head was uh, Independence Day. I mean, how can you not like a power book that destroys a whole frick ton of aliens? I mean, that's the coolest thing. And it was also a, it was a prototype power book as well, so it's also a rare piece of hardware. Uh, but yeah, go Jeff Goldblum. Kill those aliens. <laughs> Have you reviewed that computer yet, the prototype? I did, because I know a collector that has one. It's a power book. X, 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 it says on the bezel, because it was a prototype. But yeah, they're, they're very rare, but they're very cool. And is it quite porn hidden in there, too? The X, I don't know, X, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who's, no, nobody else is gonna say War Games? Uh, that was oh, what yeah. I was talking about. Yeah. Greetings, Professor Falcon. Yeah, yeah. I would, say, I would say War Games, but also like a general love of technology, uh, sneakers. Who, who here loves sneakers? Yeah, thank you. That was, that was a, a kind of a delve into my probably not so productive career in computers. I don't know what you call it a career, but, uh, but yeah. So I would definitely say sneakers is it for me. Yeah, I really remember the movie. Um, it was about these kids who made a bubble that could like take them into space, explorers. explorers. <laughs> and there was an Apple IIc, and I remember I had a IIc at the time, and I thought, it's not even plugged into power. It couldn't possibly work. <laughs> so my brain was always thinking, like, where are the wires? So yeah. So you had no trouble with the space bubble. No, no, no. That seems, you know, <laughs> legit. That's fine. <laughs> but the fact they use an Apple II, well, I don't know. couldn't power an Apple II. <laughs> I have it on good authority that Jurassic Park runs on Unix. And, and do you know as, this? As a Unix person, I'm, I'm kind of in favor of this. <laughs> okay, Jumpin' Jack Flash. Oh, that, what was Sperry R was the name me. of those terminals on that movie, yes. Yeah, I, mean, I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I got mileage out of that question. Um. <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Are you recording? So let's, uh, this time uh, we're going to do a poll. And I want uh, the audience as, to participate in this as well. Ooh. 
So a sometimes divisive topic in vintage computing is whether or not you should keep your machines stock or if you should trick them out with as much crazy hardware as possible. Sean is already smiling. I feel called out. <laughs> so I know his answer. Um, but uh, panel and uh, audience, show of hands, uh, how many feel that you should uh, keep your condition as stock as possible, original parts only? <laughs> Sean is lying. <laughs> Who are you? Where's the real Sean? I don't know. It's called original retro, right? Yeah, is it just unless it's cursed? Is that it? <laughs> just so I can see the show of hands. Who thinks that you should totally trick it out with as much pot? Yeah, that's what I thought. How about, how about those who think that it's an individual decision? Yes, I didn't raise my hand yeah. for I just either. want both teams to have a fun time. It all goes. Anything goes. How about one of each? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go, see? Yeah. I feel comfortable doing the mods and the upgrades and taking out the original RF box and putting in something that will plug into something I own because I know there are people who keep them stock. Like, it, it's not up to the machine in front of me to... Represent. Right, be, be the museum piece for this era because, because I know that there are people that keep them stock. I feel like, okay, we're covered on that so I can then... Get it's out the soldering iron. I, Solder with an L. I have a silver badge Commodore 64 that I absolutely adore and won't change, but it's in the box and it doesn't come out very often. And the reason why is because it's so hard to get it connected to something that's modern, that's something that's easy to use. And I think ultimately my own personal opinion is that these machines want to be shared. They want to be used, they want to be discovered. We need kids to discover them and kids don't necessarily have RF compatible equipment. So please make changes, mod them, and then gift it to somebody who can actually do something with it. No, I understand that philosophy for sure, and I kind of agree with the one of each maybe thing. Yeah, but, absolutely. But, you know, at the same time, like when I'm driving down the road and I see like an old, I don't know, like Pontiac Fiero or something like that, and it's all like been added all these crazy like 10 inch to 10 foot tall spoilers and all this kind of stuff to it, and the fenders are falling off, and I'm like, you know, my daughter, I was like, oh, look, there's a Fiero. Those were so cool back in the day, but that doesn't look like. You know, the one I remember seeing. And so, mm -hmm. <laughs> One thing is we're, we're truly living in a golden age of vintage computing where there are so many talented people creating new hardware upgrades for things, and it would be a shame not to try them all. <laughs> that, that's Just a to good see. answer. <laughs> the question was a bit facetious. Uh, even though I raised my hand at stock, uh, it was the introduction of the XT-IDE that got me back into the vintage computing hobby. So... There you go. Let's move on to a topic no one wants to talk about. Generative AI. <laughs> oh, let me tell you. Boos are welcome. <laughs> yeah, sorry? No, I was making a joke. Oh, that's all right. So who used ideas. it in their channels? Mm -hmm. right. Well, <laughs> the problem with generative AI is that, at least from a vintage computing standpoint, is that none of the training sets have decently annotated vintage computer either history, information, or even pictures. If you try to ask Midjourney or something else to generate a picture of an IBM PC, you get this Lovecraftian monster <laughs> that never existed. Um, and if you try to use generative AI, for example, for writing a script, it will put out uh, details of questionable, if not completely false value. I was curious if the panel has had any experience with generative AI and if it has helped you either with the management of your hobby or your videos? Well, I'll answer that a couple of things. So I have used it a couple of times in thumbnails and the reception actually has been a little bit negative towards that. But where I've actually used it more recently is there's a game I'm developing, which I will be showing off tomorrow at my panel, but um, I used AI to generate some, not all, but some of the graphics in that. And these are full screen graphics. Now, I'm still paying an artist to do the, um, the sprites and the tiles and stuff like that because AI just cannot do that sort of thing in 16 colors. But I had several full screen artworks like the intro screen and some other little kind of like interim story screens and stuff that are coming up. And I got AI to generate them pretty well. And then I had to spend several more hours trying to down convert them to 16 colors. But <laughs> nevertheless, that would be something that if I hired an artist, it would take them weeks 
to do and charge me a lot of money, so. But the downside of that is that you'd be paying an artist. <laughs> and that's, wh- like, as an artist, that's the thing that I care. Not to, not to harp on your buzz or anything, because, like, I think people should do what they want to do and what makes them happy. But my thing is that when we do something like this that takes away from the actual human that could be doing that work, we're taking something away from all of us. And that's how I personally view it. So I try to do as much of this stuff as I can myself, even if it takes 50 times as long, which is why I do one Veronica Explains a month. And that I know that's hard, and that can be hard on some people, and that can be hard on some people's schedules. But for me, that, that adds to the joy of it, to discover that complexity. And that's the part that for me I care about the most. To your point, Jim, as a curiosity experiment, I tried to put in a prompt to generate a summary of a technology I was researching. And I put the prompt in four times, and each generated response contained some factual error. And it's just you have to research it yourself in order to see what is right and what is wrong. Um, and, and to your point, sometimes the turnaround time is just too short on a video, yeah, and you need a little piece of art for your thumbnail or, or a piece of music and you just need it then. Yeah, I think, I think what we have to understand about at least some of the current stuff we use for generative AI is that it's not, it's a language model, right? Like it, it's not actually understanding the context and the, the, the subject matter itself. Yeah, it's and not so actually intelligent. It's reason. not actually <laughs> intelligent, right? It is, it is replicating a response based on a bunch of human speech, right? It's not validating the, the stuff. And so I would say that for me, what I find useful is sometimes I will, I'll, I'll kind of detail out my a description of a video and I'll be like, all right, you know, chat GPT, whatever, look at this and give me 20 titles that you think might be good for this. Right, and then, so and then it's just giving me some ideas, being like, "Oh, well, I kind of like this one. I'm going to tweak it a little bit, and then I'm going to do this." And so it's more of like helping explore like the language piece of it, because I think that that's where its strength lies. But but yeah, like I tried the thumbnail stuff a while ago, and like I was just never comfortable with with the kind of stuff that put out, at least for my style. I did mess with Stable Diffusion for a bit, and. I tried training it on Mackie. So I tried, one thing I wanted to do was have Mackie, my character here, in like weird situations like Mackie in the Hindenburg, <laughs> Mackie in the 70s. <laughs> Mackie is like a giant Mackie, like Godzilla size. And uh, just to say the pictures that came out of that were not fun. <laughs> there was like one-eyed Mackie, three-eyed Mackie, like weird shaped. It Seven Even with Mackie. training, it's... I think it's because we we know different models of computers just like by the number of like lines or floppy drives on the front or the type of badge that it has that you can't replicate it, especially for images, exactly right with even with training on something like stable diffusion. I think I think where uh, where imagery gets tripped up is because if you think about the data sets that it's trained on, if if you were to look at photos of human beings based on the angle that the photo was taken, there might be only two or three fingers in a shot on a hand, right? And so it's, it's really interesting for AI to be able to understand that all I'm being done is being trained on these images. Some people, only one leg is visible, right? Only a few things are visible. And so it's, it's actually providing a product back that as humans, we know that that looks ridiculous. But from its standpoint, right, it's interesting. So you have to really understand the context of, of the you know, stuff you're working with. I haven't played with it (laughs) at all, but I do have a friend who I knew had played with it. And so I asked one day, I was like, could you ask that, that, that AI to look at the creation of Adam by Michelangelo and render it as if Caravaggio painted it, as if he'd been the one that got the Sistine Chapel ceiling job and it broke. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she said I can make a cat <laughs> with five legs I said okay thanks I've played around with the, the LLM the large language models a bit and I've honestly never found it to be useful for what I'm doing I think it's just the inaccuracies and the regurgitation is not actually helpful and when all the chat GPT stuff was first released and people were doing like, I'm going to work on a car with chat GPT or repair a computer. It is like 
the most useless thing to do. And like, yeah, so I could make a silly video trying to do that. But the reality is I'm still doing the thinking and the work because the large language model has no intelligence. Mm -hmm. And, and I think calling it AI is honestly silly, ridiculous is ridiculous. Since I came across as the Luddite when it comes to AI, I'm going to try to redeem myself with a little bit of a, an anecdote where I actually really do think there's a really good use for LLMs in making your captions for videos where like what Google creates by default when you upload to YouTube can be atrocious. Whereas using uh, like I, I have a locally hosted language model as part of my editor that re builds the captions in a way that is clear and complete sentences. And I can tell you, I get a ton of comments on the quality of the captions because they are easily translatable to other languages, which helps us share this yeah, stuff with so. other people. There is a huge advantage to using LLMs versus letting Google do it. Ultimately, if you can write it yourself, if you're scripting or whatever, like you can just upload that to Google and that's usually sufficient. But if you're doing unscripted work, an LLM is definitely a useful tool. I don't want to sound like I'm just harping on all of it, because I'm not. There, I think there are some good uses and some not so good uses. Yeah, for grammar checking, it's Yeah, absolutely. It's good. Yeah. I like my spell checker. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Oh, one thing that is, I found positive, this is going back to graphics, but is AI upscaling of old images that oh, you yeah. find online that are either scans that have a bunch of dots, mm -hmm. you know, or a picture that's from GeoCities that's 800 by 600, and you need to s scale it up to 4K, AI upscalers do work well for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, regarding Veronica's point, um, I also uh, have been using uh, Whisper. Yeah, to, that's what I use. To, yeah, uh, the Whisper, specifically the large language model, which you need like a lot of video RAM for, is fantastic at producing uh, sub-second exact subtitles. So if you don't like doing captions. And it uh, helps everybody enjoy your work, not just some people. And that's, I think that's really important. Does it translate it too? It can actually, I know I don't speak the other languages, so I can't tell if it's good, but there, I have other people who've done it and they say it's actually really quite good at it. So. Is that free or a paid service? Um, it's, it, it's a Python. You can pip3 install open AI dash whisper in your favorite terminal. Sorry, I'm still using 2.7. <laughs> Can I run it on a Commodore 64? I mean, uh, maybe, maybe. Well, technically, yeah. It'll take a really long time. <laughs> like mining Bitcoin, you know, it takes 18 years. Jim, there's a uh, new feature, recent uh, release of Premiere that has AI-based transcription right in it. You just click a button, boom, you've got the transcription. All right, Big Spender with your Adobe <laughs> Cloud. D David's not here to, the other David, to give you a hard time. So. Um, I have actually used that, uh, the Premiere uh, transcription. I felt it, I don't think it does the best job of transcription, especially using vintage computing terms, because it always thinks you're saying something else, because it was trained on a generic English library. But it is fantastic for doing quick edits, where you highlight the text and kill it. Oh, and, that, and that cuts out the frames in the actual video. So, so it can be used for some things, which is what I was hoping to get out of the panel. <laughs> um, so let's go from the absolute bleeding ed edge of technology to failed technology. Oh. Growing up, there were all sorts of new products introduced during the birth of the personal computer, um, and not all of them succeeded. And I was I, asking the panel, is there anything that you were super excited to see introduced, some new technology that you thought was going to be fantastic, and it flew like a lead balloon and completely failed and flopped. Google Wave. <laughs> Does anybody remember Google Wave? No. What's that? Okay. So so um, it is a it was a multiple communication platform from Google, which is why it's dead. But the the idea was you could type, you could share, you could do all this stuff in real time well before Google Docs. And it was multimodal in that you could build out like your spreadsheets or like my band at the time built lyrics and could share stems for audio with each other in real time. So the other person makes a change and it automatically replaces the current file with the new one. This was super awesome tech that I'm pretty sure Google just mined into becoming Google Drive and separated it into less fun things that we now use at work every day and it's annoying. But Google Wave was actually a really good creative tool. 
building on top of that, if you just want to look at all the projects Google killed, spoiler alert, it's a lot, just to look up the Google graveyard, you'll see a lot of stuff and Wave will be in there. Google graveyard. If we're, if we're talking about things that like were awesome but became not less awesome, I was more thinking the question was, what were you super hyped about that ended up being terrible? And for me, that was the virtual boy. When I was a kid, oh, even, yeah, even when I was a kid, right? Like going up, I was so excited, went to my local game shop. You go in, you waited in line, right? In order to get like a turn at this thing. And I was just like, what, what is this? Like this is, it was so bad, even at the time, I don't know, was it was a nine or something, but it was just terrible. Was my first job was at a Toys R Us, and I was so excited to try one of those out. I worked Christmas season, and uh, yeah, I got a headache like two seconds in. <laughs> there was so much hype around VR at that time with like the Lawnmower Man movie and things like that, and then it was just such a huge letdown until 20 years later. Yep. I'll probably Wait. get roasted for saying yep. this, but I remember going into the arcade back in the um, late, late 80s, and seeing Dragon's Lair. And there was always a big long line, so I could never play it, but I could always see the people playing it, and I'm like, oh, that looks so cool. They're playing the character and doing all these things, and then finally one day I was like, there's no line. I can go play it. I put my coins in, and I'm like, really? This is how this works? This it was is a dollar, <laughs> and you <laughs> died instantly, right? And I'm like, you're not controlling anything. You're just switching scenes. Uh, it was, that was a letdown for me. I, I guess you could say that, the same with the, uh, there was a, a 3D or like a holographic game that came out around the early 90s, I think. And I can't remember what that's called. It was a big white cabinet. Oh, time Bandit time or Time Traveler, time traveler or something traveler. like yeah. that. Yeah, and it looked so cool. But when I finally got to play it, I was like, no. You know. But it looks cool, right? <laughs> it looks cool. I think the biggest hype technology thing, and it's not retro, to me, that was the hugest letdown was the freaking Segway. It was like, <laughs> they're going to build cities around this. Oh, thing. I mean, Segway. Yeah. Now you see like the occasional tour group and people falling on their butts. And then yeah, I'm like, what? Tour, tour groups and mall cops would strongly yes. disagree with you. <laughs> it's not that that technology didn't involve into like those one wheel scooters and things, but you definitely don't see them like every day, everywhere. They see me rolling <laughs> on my Segway. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good segue into our next question. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice segue. <laughs> I was going to segue into, into audience questions. Yeah. So why don't we go ahead and uh, if anyone has any questions for the panel, uh, please go ahead and uh, line up here in front of this microphone, uh, center aisle. If no one does, the Matt, fact that no one's there. moving makes me a little nervous. Uh, I was like, uh -oh. While they're moving, I'll add a little, I'll add a little tidbit to the segue thing. Um, it is one of those inventions where the guy that made the invention was killed by his invention. He died on a segue. The irony. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to bring the room down, but <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> uh, my personal answer to that last question: portrait monitors. Where are all the portrait monitors? I saw some what? out there on the floor. Well, yeah, the, the, the pivot. I'm a big fan of the LG dual up monitor, which is, oh, yeah. a, it's, what is it? Basically, it's a 16 by 17, or it's basically a square, which it's is. Like a 16 by 9 twice, isn't it? Yes, it's yeah. on top of each other, 16 by 9. So whatever that adds up. Well, that <laughs> is true. I, I was going to add before I quit to do the YouTube stuff. I used to run the dual, you know, 16 by nine and the turned 16 by nine. So, you know, the better monitors have the pivot. Yeah. So I think that was the evolution of the old, and it was really for, yeah, looking at PDFs and stuff without scrolling. And TikTok. Uh, yeah. Odd. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, let's take some audience questions. Just feel, feel free to ask. And uh, when you ask, um, if you're directing to one specific person, please mention that. Otherwise, uh, we'll assume it's for the whole panel. Hello. Yeah, a question for Macintosh librarian. Ah, um, first again. Yes. <laughs> at the end of your YouTube videos, yes. um, there's sort of a, a, a instrumental Muzak version of Mark Morrison, Return of the Mac. <laughs> yes, there Can is. Can you tell us where that is or where we could find that? Oh, so that was uh, something that I put together it was kind of hacked together from a MIDI of it, and I added some extra instruments and changed up. I'm actually using the uh, 
the Yamaha Sega Ma or Mega, Mega Drive uh, chip uh, synthesizer oh, sure, okay. to play it. So um, I have on Patreon, I actually posted the full version of the song. I didn't want to get Mark Morrison and uh, a lawsuit from him. So I did not post the full thing on YouTube, <laughs> but okay. it's on Patreon. And uh, yeah, I can send, I, maybe I'll post it on my YouTube channel later on. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question for like the whole general panel. Um, hate to pit you against each other, but who is your favorite person on the panel other than yourself? <laughs> the moderator. Yes. This, yes. Yeah. The Good moderator. Song. You saved us. <laughs> Yay, moderator. Thinking. <laughs> but by the way, guys, this is the hardest working man in this whole building. I uh, just want to say that, I mean, but seriously, Jim. Jim. Um, thank you, Jim. Yeah. 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 I mean, we personally harassed him quite a bit, just about everything that's going on, and that was just us, so he's, he's doing a great job. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you Thank you, thank you for much. doing this. All right. Uh, question for the whole panel, but first, a quick thing for Sean. Uh, do you mind if we talk about something after we're done? Uh, about... Uh, I have an issue with one of my Macs at home. Oh, yeah. yeah, so yeah, I think I might want your advice for that. But anyways, for a whole panel, uh, sorry, my, my uh, throat's kind of sore today. Uh, what exactly got you into doing YouTube in general? Right? What got your set to thinking, hey, I can convert my love of technology into uh, something that everyone can enjoy? I mean, for me, it was watching other YouTubers. Like, uh, one of my favorites back in the day was Dan Wood, who does a lot of Amiga stuff, and he would get... I remember specifically he did a video getting his Amiga online and going on to AmiNet, and I was thinking, I wonder if I could do that with my Macs, and then, like, uh, you know, it kind of inspired me to try to film it, and it just sort of went from there. Amy said, Taylor, I want you to make me internet famous. <laughs> I've done my best. We're still waiting, but... <laughs> well, that me, and yeah. COVID, I think, because we, we, we just decided to film what we were already doing. Yeah. <laughs> They're like this all the time. <laughs> she, yeah, she's figured that out. She's been around. So uh, a, a few years ago, there was this pandemic or something, and <laughs> I, I was stuck at home for a long period of time, and I needed Weird. to do something with my time, and it was a good excuse to buy a bunch of old computers. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, um, I actually had a, a love of kind of the, the making of videos in the first place. Mm -hmm. I really hadn't explored it a lot. And so kind of, you know, similar, I, in watching other YouTubers, I was like, you know what, like, I, I might be able to do this. And I was doing the projects anyway, and so it was kind of like, okay. Now, what I didn't realize is that at least for me, it takes 10 times longer to film and produce something than doing the actual project itself. So for me, you, like, the, in, in, in the way that I do it, I have to love the actual kind of like the production of it, right? The filming, the, the color, the, you know, the story. Um, that's, that's really a big part for me. And so it was, a, it was just a, a way to have another kind of creative outlet. And so watching other YouTubers really kind of lit that fire for me. I was an AV nerd in high school. I don't know if any, anybody <laughs> AV represent. No. And so like I was always making media of any sort of type and it, you know, seeing you know people on this panel and people that aren't on this panel, but but you know very well could be um, doing really good work over the years, especially since um, the the birth of like modern YouTube, where your internet speed could actually make watching several videos in a row much easier. Um, it it just was inspiring, and you know, like it just became a thing. Like, oh, I'll take that information that I know from high school, and I'll just translate it into doing doing something fun for my friends, and it just kind of blew up from there. Thanks for your question. So what is a machine that you knew about back in the day, you really, really wanted it, but you, you couldn't get it back when it was new? And you know, years and years passed, and now you're doing this you know, years later, and you finally got that machine. What machine is that for you? Power Mac G5. She's yep. <laughs> the The next cube. Yes. That was my... Yes. Yeah. Uh, IBM ThinkPad 701C. Oh. Yep. And that's why I now run 701C.org. I kind of went a little deep on that one. <laughs> but uh, but nice yeah. Plug. 
I always wanted one of the Tandy portable laptops mm. when I was a kid. I'd see them in Radio Shack, but they were really expensive, and there was no way I could afford one back then. How many do you have now? I think three or four now. <laughs> <laughs> Amiga 500 was yeah. my thing. Multimedia powerhouse in a small form factor. I always wanted one. My parents were IBM people, so we didn't do it. That was one of my first computers. Yeah, no, it, was, it looked really cool, and I'm just come to my house. I should have. <laughs> next, next time, next childhood. My friend's dad had a Commodore SX-64 on the kitchen table when I was over there one time, and I was just blown away by this little color display, and it was awesome and unobtainable. So that was my holy grail growing up, and now that I have one, I'm like, well, it's a nice, nice machine to have, but practicality, and, you know, yeah. not so much. I always just wanted what my, you know, back in the early days, because, you know, the older folks here, <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you know, you had one computer, and you couldn't just you have anything because your family's money wasn't unlimited, right? So you go to your friend's house, you're like, oh, that's a cool computer. Oh, and that's a cool computer. So I kind of wanted to have everything else, so I have everything now. So <laughs> that was my solution. There was no one thing. It was everything. Yeah, when we were little, I would go to Amy's house because she had an Atari. <gasps> Y'all. I only had an Odyssey, too, and I had, I had low self-esteem about that, but now I love it. Um, <laughs> And she would come over and play that with me. So I'm totally the same. Yeah. Yeah. And then my neighbors got a Nintendo. And you're like, that rocks. And I'm like, and my life changed forever. <laughs> but no, for me, it was Commodore 64. That was the one we didn't have. Right. We had, you know, and um, the schools had Apple IIEs. So I had experience with that. But yeah, I was like, that's really cute. A little Commodore. I, the funny thing is, like, I never had a 64 growing up either. And even though I fixed them a lot on the channel, and I, I, I weirdly feel like a, I don't know, like a regret, like a tinge of regret going, this computer is so cool. And I can't believe all the stuff I missed out on with my Apple II. And I, no offense to Apple II fans, I love my Apple IIs as well. But 64 for a kid with games, it just kicks ass. Yeah, we had. You weren't using multiplan on the Commodore 64? No, 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 no. That was my favorite game. No. <laughs> I used you Apple Works on my run Apple II. <laughs> just multiplan speed run. Go check out Taylor We're and Amy's show. We're the best at it, yes. I mean, there are those Excel games now, aren't yeah, they? No, you can speed run Excel, you can speed run multiplan. <laughs> Thanks very much. All right, I got a question for the uh, whole panel here. What is your favorite computer operating system? IQ. <laughs> really? <Yeah>. Linux. <laughs> Which Linux? All of them. <laughs> Fair enough. I use Debian every day, though. So when people ask me what I'm using, I'm I'm old school. It's Debian. I got I got the the like bookworm on my laptop, and I got Sid on the desktop. And I was too intimidated by the website, so I'm running Linux Mint. <laughs> GNU Linux. <laughs> GNU. <Gano. laughs> Enter Enterprise Linux in the streets and Debian in the sheets. <laughs> Windows XP. <laughs> like the shirt, by the way. Yeah. Oh, my, my sweater. Yeah, my, official, right. my official Microsoft ugly sweater. Windows XP Bliss Hill. With the mouse pointer. Well, that's oh, what I meant, but... Yeah. It's on, un, under your badge. Oh, hey, look, there's a mouse pointer on me. Okay. <laughs> oddly, <Very nice>. not, <laughs> oddly not pointing to Ken. There you go. Yeah, it's just, it's just pointing at me now. <laughs> it's Ken's fashion show. Yeah. <laughs> Stand up, Ken. Spin those, around. Those, <laughs> Ken's fashion show. These are some scary words to hear. Yeah, look at that. Mm, feels very nice. <laughs> catwalk, yeah. I was going to add, and I'm, this is probably the, the, the OS question. This is not my favorite, but I have to say, I still am a Windows user because I get it, it's what gets me the work done. I wish you luck on your quest. No, I'm, there are so many old programs I run that are like 20 years old. They still work, and I'm sorry, trying to do that on other platforms is no, just no. You use what you should use. Like you use what what works for you. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I'm running like tools for programming or designing Gal equations, and they are just not on other no, platforms. Yep, and then dealing with wine and all that stuff is just a hassle. Have you ever tried Lindos? <laughs> I've played around that stuff. That the wine implementation is sketchy at best. So how was the 
<laughs> yeah, like I don't, I'm not an infosec anymore. That was my old career. I left. <laughs> So I'm just another Dave, and I have a question that builds on this last one a little bit, I think. So the question is, and I want you to keep it to one, what is your one digital technology that was used for the longest amount of time that you can think of? So for me, I think it's a palm trail. My handspring visor Neo. I used it all the way from middle school until college. It was a clear smoke black one. It was beautiful. And it had a modem too, and it was cool. I used to go on AIM. It was nice. And the visor had silver buttons. I have an iPod fourth gen, black and white, that I bought back then, and I still use today. What year was that, Veronica, would you say? Like 2004? So like we're, we're maybe 2005, I don't know, somewhere in that ballpark. But it's like it's almost 20 years old and it's still kicking. I've got a, I've still got a CRT that is still alive and it's probably about 25 years old and I've used it on and off for those 25 years. Yeah, I haven't uh, seen my house. I have about 80 CRTs. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't say I just have one. That one's still alive. <laughs> well, all of mine are fixed. So yeah. <laughs> So I don't know if I can use software as an example of technology, but I still use PaintShop Pro <laughs> from the 1990s every day because I've not found anything else that works as well for pixel art as that does. PaintShop Pro was solid. <laughs> I think it's amazing. I have a Pixel 4. Ken doesn't use old technology. Oh, well, I don't use anything that's old and interesting, really. I just <laughs> I got a camera that's 10 years old that I just upgraded from. Woo, exciting. I uh, use a second-gen iPad as the controller for my camera. Uh, I've had it since new. I bought it like on launch day, and it's engraved. I don't know why I paid for that. But I had that on a stand, and that ha still runs the app that controls my camera. So. <laughs> use that every every day. <laughs> oh, I thought of another one. I still have a PS3 in my entertainment Ooh, center yeah. because it's the only thing that plays DVDs mm -hmm. and Blu-rays. Yeah. That's a good one. Now I feel old. It's retro now, but it wasn't when it was there. Cool. My Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> <laughs> That's legit. Still cranks. <laughs> So I know that we recently talked about uh, people's opinions on upgrading uh, your stock hardware to, uh, to something more powerful, but the question I had was your thoughts on new products or new pieces of hardware that's open source that requires new old stock or salvage components, uh, knowing that those are in limited supply. Uh, how are you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you try to avoid them? Do you still use them until they run out? Or do you just pray that somebody makes an FPGA implementation sometime? So for example, you're saying like, a new homebrew, but it requires you to pull a SID off a C64. Um, uh, yeah, or like... Or a uh, CPU or something like that. Um, yeah, or like a YM38-12 for a Sound Blaster clone or something like that. Yeah, I've got a um, the C64 reloaded, so it's a brand new motherboard for a C64, but you've got to pull the chips off of one. Sure, I had one that had broken traces. The chips were all fine, but the machine didn't boot, and so it was like, A, I can now use these chips and do something, and B, this board takes a power supply that's much safer than the original Commodore one. So um, I was very glad that somebody had come up with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, oh, no, go ahead, Matt. I'm a big proponent of all of the new projects, whether they're using old components or replacing them. And unfortunately, with some of those, those proprietary chips, SIDS and VIX and you know, whatever on other computers, those can be some of the hardest things to replicate easily. And with FPGA replacements that are coming online with for a lot of them, they're just not quite there yet. Not to mention they're usually more expensive than the hard to find ones you can still get. But I'm glad that someone put the effort into the development work because as time goes on, then those, you know, those other chips will be gone and then we'll be able to keep these things alive. But with the whole software to find hardware, the microcontrollers like the RP2040, being able to replace Gravis ultrasounds, yeah. ad libs, all sorts of hardware means that 
potentially you could have a drop in replacement for whatever that's on a you know four dollar thing and but it's the software development that went into the original fpga work that's been translated into these cheap things that is great and one one thing i love about those projects too is often they document really well stuff that we did not have documented and that is so important because that documentation is going to help us repair the original thing as well as develop new stuff and for that i love these projects same i i'm on the of the take a penny leave a penny approach which is i, I just hope to god that people keep making things and yes. reverse engineering but i also try to contribute i'm not I'm not a super whiz, but I was able to re reverse engineer a battery controller for an IBM battery. And that was a chip that, to your point, like there's documentation, but it's just flat wrong. And you don't know <laughs> until you actually dig into it, you start looking at the signals, and you start actually doing some real reverse engineering work. So half of it is absolutely the people that are making these things, but the other half is the people that are saying, by the way, this is how it works. Because Adrian, to your point, down the road, there's going to be better ways to emulate these things, but unless you actually know what you're doing, all that information could just be lost to time. I'm glad they're making these things because even if it's new old stock, some of these old chips are just dying on the shelf. Moisture's getting in and, and the dyes are going, and so they're not gonna last forever. Uh, it might be a perennial question, so please no disassemble number five. Um, but uh, for those of you who do rebuilds, teardowns, anybody wants to chime in, what is the most frustrating hair tearing out project you've done to date and or which project uh, that you've done would be like one where it was, when you got to the end and got success, you were like, yes, like the biggest success you think you've had? I'm going to answer for Adrian. You worked on a motherboard so bad that it caused you to collaborate with someone to create a brand new RAM test. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I forgot even, it was the first one of TRS-80 maybe? I don't remember what our first one was. We've now ported that to a bunch of things. It's, it's funny because um, I don't think I really get too frustrated working on this stuff, even though sometimes it can be so hard. But often, I think my TRS-80 Model 2 was the hardest one. That, that computer used cards. So you can't work on, you have to run the machine and the cards are, you can't access them. The old technicians had risers and things, right? That well, at the time I didn't have. So troubleshooting it was so hard because all these multiple cards. But when I solved it with the use of uh, a diagnostic ROM that my friend David in Portland helped create, we were, I was able to identify that the fault was on the disk controller with the chip select logic. And I would have never figured that out because the only way I knew is as it was testing the RAM banks, the floppy light was coming off and on. And I was like, bling, like light bulb moment. And man, I felt good. And I was like, I looked at the schematics. I'm like, it's got to be this chip. And it was. It was like the select lines are looking at the wrong address lines. But without that modernly created software RAM test, I would have probably never gotten there because I just had no way to run this machine in front of me, you know, without the cards being inaccessible. But man, I felt good when it worked. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say that the, the projects that are the most frustrating are probably the most rewarding at the end of the day, right? It's right. the same ones. And just for me, it's, it, was that, it was that battery management IC clone. Because I'm sitting there looking at, I know that this chip is from this manufacturer. They've got a whole data sheet. I know that this is the protocol that it runs on, but it just wasn't, it wasn't cooperating. It wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. And it's just maddening because there is nothing out there, right? You might be able to see like an email of a forum post, right? Like decades ago where somebody mentioned something that it was non-standard, but like all that, all that information's lost. So when you actually crack it, oh my God, like that's just the best feeling in the world. All right, mine might sound a little bit nerdy, but. <laughs> what? <laughs> in the right place, okay. <laughs> I, and I didn't really even make any videos about it, I don't think, but my first VCF I ever exhibited at, I wanted to set up a local Circle Mud, which is like a multiplayer text-based game, but I wanted to run it on AUX, and mm -hmm. Circle Mud didn't want to compile, and it took me forever. Like, I'm not really a C program. I, don't, I know, like, this much. Hey, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it took so long to figure it out just by, like, trial and error and, like, looking stuff up and, like, ancient documentation. But I finally got it to work, a little bit of a memory leak, crashed about every three hours, restarted, but it worked the whole weekend. So that, that's mine. 
<laughs> yeah, I think I think I remember. You may have not have documented like that troubleshooting process, but I think I remember the video when you got it to work, and your face was probably a combination of like just relieved and just exhausted. It was pretty good. Mine's the scope tricks because I had to go through two oscilloscopes. <laughs> yes. yeah, I. When I finally saw what looked vaguely like a video game on that oscilloscope, tears, tears of joy. I forgot if you said, from the magic of buying three other ones, <laughs> yes. here we can demonstrate the scope yes. Yes. Like a tower of them this tall. Bless technology connections. <laughs> it's funny, were you, they were all Tektronix scopes I think you bought. Yeah, and uh, Tektronix is based in Portland, and uh, I've met a bunch of the engineers, you know, because they have a museum. Can I have a word? Well, them? it's funny because I, <laughs> I have also tried to repair one of those things, and it is a nightmare. I watched your whole repair video oh, and trying it was, to salvage the first yeah, one. Yeah, and that, that, I never even got that thing fixed. I gave it away because I was like, I don't want to see this anymore. So this question goes towards the entire panel. I know that kind of the other guy that was about two questions ago kind of had a question that touched on this before, but by and large, has the emulation community has the emulation community been a boon or a hindrance to your activities or your endeavors? Absolute boon. Oh, boon. Love it, boon. I would imagine without emulators, I would have done very little of the programming that I've done over the last several years because it's just so much easier to do and test with the emulators. Absolutely. Emulate early and often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The FPGA projects are really about preservation as well, and they Absolutely. are, you know, decapping arcade boards and, and reverse engineering it, documenting it. So it's it's awesome. Yeah, and I want to add like the, the there's a Commodore 64 emulation scene with Vice. A lot of that work that's gone into that developer, I mean, into that piece of software, has turned into physical hardware. Absolutely. Because like Kawari, yeah, yeah, the Kawari, which is the Vic Two, the SID stuff is the open source things at least are using that code from the emulator because they the developers put so much work into making it so accurate. And there's like 200 unit tests for video in Vice. They use that as the basis. Exactly. Basics of the Quari. So it's kind of amazing in a way. Like I don't think we would necessarily be where we are with say six C64 preservation without it. Not to mention what David said is be able to easily develop software on modern computers and you know compile run tests so quickly with an emulator that it's so perfect that you know it's going to work on real hardware too yeah. i think it also helps people that don't have the hardware get into hardware yes. that they didn't have before like i was emulating game boy nintendo 64 when i was younger and i didn't have those. <laughs> I'm that crowd as well and so dirty pleasure i was playing games that i was pirating but yeah, that was <laughs> borrowing. But it was a way for me to get into. <laughs> Mackie knows he doesn't copy that floppy. He's all cool. But it's a way for people, like even now, like they can spin up infinitemac.org is a website where you can load up Macintosh images, Next images, for people that just want to play their favorite game without having to spend the time to build a new machine. It's, it's awesome. I mean, shout out to archive.org for putting all that software online with the emulators right in your web browser. You click right. a button, no matter what the console or platform is, you're playing that game or a piece of software just and, like that. And the Tosec archives on archive.org, just complete catalog for every system. Amazing. Absolutely. That's how I learned multiplan. <laughs> and from finally, a YouTube perspective, emulators are awesome if you're doing video capture because it's harder to get it from real yeah. hardware a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of the web-based emulators were um, some kind of just you know based on thought experiments. What a lot of things are initially done, but they're so valuable, right? Because if you think about it, like some of the even the Mac emulators, right? They're they're non-trivial to get running, right? Especially with the neat, with the you know ROMs that you need and things like that. And so somebody to make it accessible to so just go to a website address and even be able to upload a disk image, yeah. right? To be able to get into things that way is just super cool. And it's funny that I worked on this uh, Plexus Unix computer on the channel and it was an unknown machine that never really got any light of day anywhere. And the community was able to take the information I was able to recover off the machine and use constituent parts from MAME, which had emulation of all the components. And we have an emulator now running for the Plexus machine, a machine that was like, how many do they sell? Hundreds? And it's dead to the world. And now there's an emulator. Yep. No, there you go. I'd like to offer the single dissenting opinion <laughs> in that, uh, as a historian, it has sometimes made my job harder when the emulators are not exact. Right. 
So I have to, so someone will say, you know, this game doesn't run right, or this demo doesn't run right, and I have to explain. It's because, it's because, it's because the, the demo and the game broke the emulator, not the other way around. And uh, doesn't, don't your, the demos you've done uh, detect and say that, don't they, when you launch them? Mine do, because uh, <laughs> I was making sure that they would warn the user right. if they were not on original hardware. But, um, but no, for the most part, of course, emulation is fantastic. And... Uh, it should be encouraged. I think it just highlights how the PC emulation scene is kind of crap compared to, say, 64. Well, <laughs> up, up until um, there was a uh, Daniel uh, earlier this morning gave a presentation on Marty PC and how it can run uh, pretty much everything perfectly. And he also broke down what he had to do in the emulator and so on to make it work. So Marty PC is the first cycle accurate uh, IBM PC 5150 wow. emulator. Ooh, okay. So. Finally, in 2024, finally. I mean, Jim, the question for you is that on, in the PC world, cycle accurate software was just not really as much of a thing as it was on other platforms, right? Don't, did you that's right, and that's because of the, uh, as soon as the clones started coming, they were all different people speeds. couldn't. Yeah, they were all different speeds and different compatibility of hardware. You couldn't write something that would be cycle exact. Uh, that's another reason copy protection started to phase out a little earlier on PCs because the copy protection schemes wouldn't work, and more clones were being sold with hard drives. Right. And so that's funny. I think that kind of led to the emulation not needing to be cycle accurate, not cycle accurate, and that's why the demos that do target it, which you guys do, that's why they never ran. That's interesting. Thanks for your question. <laughs> okay, I have a um, rather general question for the whole panel. Um, for you, what is retro? Because for some people, retro is like 70s. For some people, it's 80s. For some people, it's like whatever they use as a kid. But some people say retro is whatever hardware that's not dead when the server closes down, whatever game that doesn't go with the company, and uh, any hardware that doesn't end when the official support ends, like some of the newer stuff that's just one blob, and when, when it dies, no re replacement parts and stuff. So I think my question boils down to, while the like iPhone 16, 70, whatever the latest one is, or while the Minecraft and Roblox and like Fortnite become retro one day, I've got I've got what might be a controversial answer to that one. Maybe um, I think vintage yeah. is a year, yeah. right? And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue on what line that is. Yeah. And retro is a feeling. Yep. Yeah. I was gonna say retro is an aesthetic to use a, a word that is popular, whereas vintage is a dating system. Yeah. And I, I think that that makes a distinction because like there, you know, there are some great computers being made right now that are retro and not vintage. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a distinction to be made here with how we talk about it. Um, like people making new things for the Commodore 64 aren't making vintage things, they're making retro things. And they're helping expand retro as an idea but like get, using Wi-Fi on your Commodore 64 is not something we were doing in the 80s. And so that like that's retro and not vintage, if, if that makes sense. I, I think there's a yeah, bit of distinction. Yeah, that's why I use the word retro Yeah, in my question. Yeah, and I think like that when you, what, that from, to, to dovetail onto that, the feel, that retro feel, I think is up to the, to the person. Yep. Because uh, we're of all different age groups here, and I know me, when I look at something from the late 90s, I'm just like, Psh, ugh, whatever. But there's lots of folks who do care about that, like, and, and I think it all depends on what your sensibilities and your perspective is on things. There are people in this room for whom Flappy Bird is retro. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> yeah, it really has no, defi no definition, no formal definition, so it means something different to, to everybody. Um, I'll say this, when I am using an emulator to play a game, I consider myself retro gaming. When I use the actual hardware to play a game, I consider myself vintage gaming. Yeah. So, that's, it's a terminology. This is a question for the whole panel, and doesn't have to be about vintage computing. What about computing attracts you most to it? Is it the history of it, the building of it, the fixing? Which part about it? I think for me, and especially with old computers, it's like if you turn on a computer, it's just a perfect time capsule in that point of history. So I love turning on a computer, seeing you know what the how it was set up, what it was used for, and you know even you know you, 
erase your computers before you give them away or sell them. Don't leave your personal information on there. But if it is there and you just happen to see it, I mean, it's a, just a really interesting snapshot of the time. Like I found a K-Pro that had a hard drive hacked into it and all these modifications. Like this person obviously loved it. And inside on in CPM was all of this writing that this person had done. And they like took this thing to Saudi Arabia and they worked as a contractor and they took it back and it was all over the world and like all these like weird writings about like George Bush, like his thoughts on George, the original George Bush. And it's just such a perfect time capsule. You turn it on, it's like no time has passed. For me, the, the main appeal of older computers is uh, industrial design. Seeing how industrial design affected like SGI and Apple, like how cases were curvy and colorful instead of just beige boxes. So for me, it's all about the molding of the case and all the little details and industrial design things that you know, like, like Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive were super nitpicky about to make like really pretty computers. So for me, it's all about the aesthetic of the, like the, the design of the computers. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in a similar boat as you, Ken. I think also the people behind that made all the decisions that go into some of the early computers that then influenced the next generation, which then influenced the phones that we use now. Like it's all domino effect and the people behind it is kind of what and, and yeah and just as a quick like mini history thing if I'm not mistaken Apple was the first company to actually have a dedicated industrial design team for computers so if you look at a lot of their old stuff it's usually a little more standoutish than just like a you know a beige box but other companies do a good job too like SGI machines I don't even use SGI machines but I just want to look at them because they're so colorful they're just pretty and, and I also use an SGI system to stop dinosaurs you know at Jurassic Park like yeah. we all do yeah you know, on a Tuesday. So, so I was a I was a nerd as a kid. I don't know. It, it, raise your hand if you were a nerd. Who all here? Okay, raise your hand if you were picked on for being a nerd. Okay, I got news for you all. We won. And. The joy of computing now is something that we can share and that people find exciting and something that has entered the general zeitgeist, another word, um, that is something that I find so exciting to be part of and that there are people like young people who care about this stuff. That is the thing that I find to be so thrilling because they are discovering an alternative to the little rectangle that looks the same as somebody else's little rectangle. And I think that is something that I find to be incredibly exciting. Yeah, it's funny in a way what you're saying is like the technology we use now, especially the portable stuff, is so homogenized yeah. and it has none of the variability that we had in the 80s, for instance, where platforms were incompatible and wildly different from one to another. And while technology now is easy to use and super approachable, on the other hand, the intrigue, I don't know, it's boring, yeah. I mean, it's good, but, but it's I would It's nerds never... like us who Wait. made it get good and usable. Yeah. Let me unpack this. And it's this. other people who made it homogenized. Okay, let me unpack this a little bit. Okay, Gen X, Gen X. Who else on the panel is Generation X? Born between 1965 and 1980. Oh, okay. yeah. Bunch of hippies. In the room. <laughs> Gen X. Okay. Representing there. All right, we remember screens being completely passive. All we did was watch it. It was TV. And the first time I pushed a button or moved a joystick and it made the TV do something. <laughs> Let me talk to you about, it was joy. Yeah. It was yeah. joy. I was, I could not believe it. Yeah, to, to get your TV to do anything, you went up to it and went click, click, and it was mechanical, but it was not like you were seeing text and information. Right, it was just changing what the passive source was. Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah, so yeah, I think that for our gener I'm speaking for all members of Generation X, <laughs> they elected me. Um, I think it's that. So I, I just have one little anecdote I wanted to put out. I think it's so interesting is, yeah, so all of our little tablets or phones, they look exactly the same, from a distance anyway. And yet it's funny how there's still wars between <laughs> Apple users and Android users, exactly the way there was. Touch grass. You know, <laughs> between Commodore and Apple and Atari and Nintendo and all that back in the 80s, we still, it's like a repeat of that yep. with this new generation over Android versus iPhone. Well, it's, it's funny, like it's, how much is actually done on the web? 
the yeah, device, it's just right? a web so like app. Your, like exactly. A so like why does your device even matter these days? Yeah, and that's just funny thing is they're still going on, like you said, David. But the reality is, an Android phone and an Apple iPhone are like barely different. <laughs> But how many times have I been insulted over the last few years as being because I have an iPhone and some Android user is like, you're just a sheep following, you know, whatever. You iPhone know. users go, ew, a green bubble. Apple junk or whatever. And I'm like, man, this has been going on since, since, since I was junior yeah. high. You know? <laughs> In 1987, our, com our school got two computer labs, an IBM lab and a Mac lab. <laughs> wow. And the knife fights were legendary. <laughs> That's no, a true story. I, I will add one thing with regards to this old technology and what I really love about it myself is that from a repair perspective, which is what I do a lot of, the approachability of these old systems is something that is just completely gone from new stuff. You are not, I was talking to some young people today that came by and looked at the Commodores I had there and I said, you program this by literally coding every single instruction to the CPU, to the graphics chip. There's no high level languages you're using. I mean, you could, right? But you know, you don't need to. But in a modern computer, that's so abstracted away, the hardware is irrelevant, really. And I think that's what's so cool about these old things is like you are in touch with the bare metal. I mean, you see it, but you're programming it directly and the software's running right on it. And that's what's so cool about it. I mean, it would be hard to remember poke statements for 64 gigabytes of RAM. Yeah, I mean, and the complexity of the OS is now, everything is just, you know, unbelievably complex. While in the old days, you know, you turned on your Apple, Ape, or whatever computer, it was just there, it was ready to go. Yep. In an instant. Yeah. Yeah, you and could write a, like the, the instruction set could fit in a whole song. You yeah, you like, could do a song yeah. about it. Yeah, I know. Weird. <laughs> I mean, spoiler the, alert. Yeah. The ability for like one person to understand like the com complete and total inner workings of a machine is is kind of amazing, right? Because today, I mean, even if you think about a graphics card, right? How many people do you think that have spent their entire careers focusing on one individual piece of a chip on a graphics card or things like that? I mean, yeah, it's it's abstraction after abstraction and breeds complexity. So so I agree. Like for me, working on old machines, it's kind of like the way I explain it is, it's kind of like working on an old car. It's very approachable. Things are a lot more simple. It gives you the basics, right? So that then you can start to understand like more modern technology and how things work. I think it's a really good way to to be to get into electrical engineering or software engineering or anything like that. I mean, it's you look at the Apple One and Apple Two. One person designed those computers. Yeah. One person, and they sold millions of them. And nowadays, you know, you can't make a game without you know a room full of people this big. And in the old days, all these games were programmed by one person and sold massive quantities of copies. And from a repairability standpoint, can you imagine the Adrian Black of 30 years from now, or for for whatever? <laughs> like, what 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 is your successor going to be repairing exactly? I mean, Jerry Ellsworth talks about this, that, you know, surface mount isn't something you should be scared of. But the reality is that you open up any laptop and every chip is custom weird versions. And it's not like they make them for 50 or 20 years, like a 64 was made for so many years. They're like replaced every year with new chips inside. So when you do need to find some weird, rare chip that was never actually sold on the market, there's no chance. Yeah. So what is the repairability, even if you can remove it and put a new one on? And is anybody going to care? Because it's all so homogenized anyway. And just d disposable, designed to be disposable. D does any of us think that there's actually going to be like a quantum version of an FPGA 30 years from now? Not 30 years, but further out, yes. <laughs> I think because things are so abstracted now, it's easier just to kind of create an emulation layer. And even if you run some new hardware, it just emulates everything. Because that's practically what we're doing now. The Intel processors don't run, you know, they're not running x86 code. They're have all those micro layers of you know emulation basically happening in the silicon. Speaking of how people can understand the entire 8-bit system and, and fit it all in their head, one thing that continually blows me away is how individual programmers are continuing to push the limits of these systems. Even to this day, we see better and better demos in, in, in games and things for these old systems that are just mind-blowing because they're building on all the techniques and tricks that people have learned throughout the last 30, 40 years. It's yeah, just like best game, you know, best pet and Vic 20 game, right? <laughs> you know, right? This man right here made so <laughs> ever.
Oh, I don't know. There's like a Wolfenstein clone out for the pet now. I don't know if you've seen that. <laughs> I think he's bested me. Well, I think that you... you uh, Jim was, Orlando, I think. So. You started the, you know, the, the wars of... He threw down game. the gauntlet. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks very much. So this is for the whole panel. You guys talked about what you were hype about back in the day that turned out to be a flop. What are you hype about today in retro computing or vintage computing that you know, maybe hopefully won't be a flop? Rhetoric's good. What, what are you hyped about today when it comes to retro computing and vintage computing? <laughs> I have to say the Commander open, yeah, well. <laughs> David is still laughing. <laughs> I was whispering Commander X16. Well, X16, yeah, yeah, of course. X16. Like subliminal message or something. The, the new stuff that's coming out, the open source things especially, are mind blowing to me and get me so excited to see people who are so smart and creative working on these old systems and bringing new life into them, releasing all these new pieces of hardware and the whole software defined hardware aspect of the Raspberry Pi 2040 and the new version that's coming out completely blows my mind that you can plug a card into a you know 40 year old computer and it's doing all this amazing stuff with it, all with the most cheap hardware possible and they're making it open source. And that to me, I, I cannot talk about how incredible that makes me feel that the community is coming together and making that possible. Yeah, like I was thinking I'm gonna um, kind of leapfrog off of that, which is what makes me the most excited are companies like, like Raspberry Pi and Amtel like, that are creating ever and ever smaller and more powerful microcontrollers that are cheap and accessible, right? So that people can make these projects and things like that, right? Because, I mean, it's, it's kind of incredible that you know, you can you can find microprocessors that are like the size of like tiny, 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 like surface mount on a, on a fingernail that can run at like 25 megahertz, right? Like something that's absolutely insane. Like that is that is a huge thing for the retro community. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, I actually have two things. First of all, to go back to a question about, about things that have been disappointed. The one thing I like to add, uh, this is not technically a technology in itself, but the one thing I was hyped for and ended up disappointed to not be a scam was the uh, Foxconn campus just about an hour away. Oh, sure. yeah. yeah. If, if you guys are aware of that. Uh, otherwise, this is a, speaking of scam, this is a uh, question for uh, Crazy Ken. What is your favorite, what, for all the scam videos you have done, which one has been your uh, favorite? Now, when you say favorite, <laughs> I mean like the most like choose your favorite child. Wait, what were you saying? But like like the like one to cover, you know, like one to cover, like the rabbit hole just gotten really. Ooh, you really put me on the spot there. Um, oh, that's a good one. Uh, I, you know, I'll just give a recent example. One, it's it's kind of a simpler example, but it was recent and it was actually a, a really well performing episode. Um, the internet is flooded with fake TV antennas that like claim to have like a thousand mile range. Scam antennas. <laughs> yeah, scam antennas. Um, when uh, actually Brainiac Brent brought this idea up to me, and this is the kind of the cool thing about being a content creator. He brings an idea up to me, and then like I'm like now crazy invested in it. So like before I knew it, I'm like touring like broadcast facilities and news places to learn about that kind of stuff. So you know, even though the, the products are a scam and people shouldn't be selling that stuff and tricking consumers, you know, from my perspective, it's still fun to like learn about how antennas actually work and then make cool animations that take a week to draw and everything to teach people on YouTube how you know waves work and all that cool stuff. So. That's a recent example. Thank you. I have one. I have two questions for the panel. What's the? What's your favorite printer? <laughs> Where's Steve? <laughs> what are you doing with the printer? Um, my favorite printer is the Epson EcoTank ET5180. So, one thing as as a dot matrix connoisseur. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I really enjoy is there, there are some micro line, um, like Oki printers that are still like made and you can still buy replacement parts for that will interface with almost anything. And so if you do want like to print banners and have fun, like the Oki micro line 420 can connect over USB to a modern computer, but it can also connect over parallel. You can get other 
components for it. You can get replacement cards for it. It's very helpful. Oki Micro Line 420 or 421 if you want it in the wider format. <laughs> and Veronica, Not sponsored. At, we were at a hotel here in the city and we were checking out and I saw the Oki Data yeah. Micro Line sitting uh, in the back. Yep, nope, that micro, that micro line is dope. <laughs> I think airlines are only just now phasing them out yep. for laser printers. But you can still get them. This might surprise you, but um, I just bought a brand new dot matrix printer. Ooh, what'd you get? <laughs> but, you know, uh, so for those that don't know, I'm opening an arcade, and in the kitchen, when we were setting up all of the point of sale stuff, we were told we needed a dot matrix printer. Oh, sure. Because thermal printers don't yep. do well in hot kitchens. Yeah. And so, sure enough, we have this little printer. It goes, yeah. and prints it. I was like, wow, they're still, I didn't even know they were still Oh, yeah, they are, they are <laughs> awesome. Because you can print, I did a video about this. You can print in triplicate or yeah. quadruplicate all at once. Whereas with a regular printer, like a modern printer, you have to print four copies of the thing. And with a, with a triplicate printer with carbonless printing and an impact, printer like a dot matrix you can print the same thing on four different sheets of paper with four different templates at the exact same time so that's why like your your local government office might be using that that's why I see it all the time those things are amazing my trash company until recently was printing right on this envelope that used an impact I guess head without of ink and uh -huh. the, it was the inside paper using like a carbon transfer. Yeah, it's amazing. So they would just print on the outside of the envelope and they would actually, your bill was inside. You tear the strip off and pull it out. And that's how I got my trash bill every month. Yep, that, that's fantastic. The fanciest trash company. <laughs> But I have to say my, my least favorite printer is the ImageWriter 2 because I had one as a kid and I loathed that printer. It jammed all the time and the color thing, it was just a disaster and it was noisy and noisy and slow. My least favorite printer is my current printer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. At any point in history. Whatever but one I do you second have. your love printer. of the EcoTank. I, have I thrown, like the EcoTank as well. I've thrown inkjet printers down the stairs in anger, so uh, yeah. I'll tell you why this EcoTank is so special. Matt, you know, you know PCL, does anybody know that? Yeah. Printer command language from HP. Um, it started in 1984, version six was the last update in 2002. My EcoTank, why is it so special, I wanna say it, is because it can print in any driver that uses yeah. the PCL standard. Oh yeah. I can print in a LaserJet 1 from modern software running on an emulator to a modern printer. Absolutely. 40 year old software to a modern printer. That's inkjet. Yeah. Near laser printer quality. Yeah. How cool is that? It's amazing. I love that. That is fantastic. As an analog, uh, analog to that, my favorite printer was my first PostScript printer. Oh, yeah. Yep, so there you go. For, for operating systems like Unix at the time, which couldn't support PCL, but they did support PostScript, yep. I could print from anything to it and it would work. Did you have a second part to your question? The best part is just the compatibility of printing 40-year-old software to a modern printer with a print server, thanks to VMware and all the emulators out there. I agree. Thanks very much for your question. You're welcome. All right, I'm directing this question to Action Retro here. Nope. <laughs> First time. All right. So when did you discover that you could either torture a computer with Linux or make it useful again? <laughs> what were your early attempts at that? Okay, well, actually, I found that I can do both at the same time. <laughs> hey, good day. Putting Linux on a machine is never torture. Sorry, I had to say Well, it, it depends on if it's going to run okay. It depends how old the computer is, okay? Yeah, didn't you put Linux on that, like, that horrible Windows yeah, so, laptop thing? Yeah, Which so one? That, that's the best example. So I had that uh, the Windows CE CVS laptop and oh that one yeah it I would don't. boot directly off of the sd card i think i had like susa tumbleweed or something oh, I love that. but i had it at vcf um, in dallas in dallas and it took like 15 minutes yeah. to go from cold boot to the desktop that useful was definitely in quotes with that one because i yeah. played around with it i'm like does not torture than useful yeah but still fun i have a question for the entire uh Thing. Um, what was the best computer deal you had and what is the worst computer deal you had? Was What's a deal? gig? Like, like what was the best deal of a computer? Like, you paid so far under the worth and it just worked and what was the worst one? I got 
my silver badge Commodore 64 from a, a seller who, like, if you're out there watching, you did have color on the computer. You were using the wrong cable. <laughs> They were absolutely convinced that it was broken, and they, I bought it thinking it was broken. I had intended on it being broken. I get it home, and I use my cable for it, and it is flawless, and, like, I couldn't reach out. I, like, I tried to call. I couldn't get a hold of the person. Like, I wanted to be like, oh, yeah, your computer that you thought was broken and that you sold to me for broken pricing, not broken. It's, it's so hard. if you're you out there watching now, I love your computer and it's mine now. It's, <laughs> it's hard to beat free, yeah. which um, I guess the best story I can tell is back around the year 1999, 2000, I think 2000, 2000, yeah, that's what it was. Uh, I was working in one of the skyscrapers in downtown Dallas and um, we were getting in the elevator one day and there was this other, you know, because there's multiple businesses in the same tower. And they had like all these pallets of uh, computers and stuff that were compacts. And I asked them, I says, what are you guys doing with all these? I've seen you making several runs down the elevator. I says, oh, we're throwing them in the dumpster. And I'm like, really? Are they broken? He says, oh, no, we just got all brand new computers and we have hundreds of these we just need to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm like, which dumpster are you putting those in? <laughs> and uh, after uh, I got off work, I drove my car around yep. and filled my, I dived into the dumpster and I uh, had a friend of mine and we were handing stuff out, <laughs> filling our cars up with these. These were compact 46s, like we're talking like 66 megahertz machines at the time and, uh, and monitors, all VGA monitors, they all worked. And then when I got home, I showed it all to my wife and then we got back in the car and we drove back to Dallas again. <laughs> Filled it up again and then did it again a third time. And I actually gave all those computers to all of my friends and family. And every, we were all set for computers for several years. Wow. <laughs> I agree, can't beat free. The, the, the most expensive or the most like kind of above what you would pay for it was actually, it's happened a few times. And it usually happens when you buy something at a good price that you think that you can fix. Absolutely. And then you need to buy like four parts laptops <laughs> exactly in order to actually get the thing working. Or you more. just take it apart and put it back together and it suddenly works. Oh God. <laughs> that's yeah. happened. That, that too. But yeah, that's a, that's a common occurrence for me, yeah, unfortunately. That's, that's the worst. Yeah. I bought an Amiga 1000 for $100. Oh. This was 25 years ago. It wasn't worth anything then, but it is now. I found a Bondi, I've been told by my Australian friends, um, a Bondi blue iMac on the street, like just sitting there. That's somebody, sad. yeah, somebody thought it was broken. Uh, clearly, at some point, they had tried to like remove a component and replace it, and they gave up and thought it was dead. I just hooked everything back up again. It was fine. So uh, I, I, I put a video about it up on, on the YouTube and, and, and nobody has, has found it. Cause like I wanna, cause it takes up a lot of space. So like I wanna give it back to the person if I can. Like, hey, I, I don't know, maybe they're not there anymore. Who knows? If, you, if, if I have your Bondi Blue iMac, please like, let me know. This one didn't happen to me, but it happened to my friend, uh, Greg Rutke from Rutke Mods. He paid $100, I think, for a clamshell iBook. It was a prototype. Ooh. So, like, it had different ports on it. It had Apple internal software and documentation on it. It's probably worth about 1000 or 1500 but he got it for 100 because the person selling it just didn't know. It had all the stickers on the bottom, too, like the internal hotline to call if there's a problem, but the seller just didn't know any better, and you know, you, you saved about a 1000 bucks just because they didn't know. So sometimes, sometimes you get lucky on eBay. <laughs> Best deal I ever got. Uh, I made a deal to purchase a rare uh, sound card for a normal-ish price, and the guy said, it's inside an IBM XT. Do you want that, too? And I'll just throw that in. <laughs> it, and when it arrived, it actually wasn't an XT. It was an XT-286, which is very oh. uncommon. Oh. So that was my best deal. That's a good one. Thanks very much. I have a question for the general panel. As retro YouTubers, how do you think is knowing the, I know this has been addressed already in some questions before, how do you think the design philosophy from 30 years ago compares to now with all the abstraction and closed nature of computing? 
By design philosophy, do you mean like the like the outward cases of aesthetics, not, not, or do you mean like ne- usability? Like not necessarily the, the 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 user interface, like the general overarching principles. I don't know like how to answer o- that with less than an hour. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know, I know that's a good. top. That's a whole panel. Yeah, yeah I just for that. I know it's a bit tough question. Uh, one thing is the, that components are getting smaller now, and so it makes like the Apple Vision. I think is a well a a very beautiful piece of hardware. But none of those parts are going to be replaceable if I want to use the Apple Vision 30 years from now. Um, but there might be something newer. But I think now we can get you know, beautiful pieces of hardware because the components are so small and they're sealed in with glue and epoxy. And it, again, it hurts repairability, but it makes a beautiful trinket that you can buy. <laughs> I, think, I think right to repair is a, is a very valuable movement not just for the just the ability for consumers to to go and and you know go to a shop and have somebody repair it with and get actual manufacturer parts and things like that but it also forces companies to design the hardware in a way that is more accessible right like less potted things less less well maybe still custom but but i think it's i think it's incredibly valuable and so you know, if, if anybody ever gets the chance to sign a petition to, to support a company who does that, um, please do so because it's a it's a really, really valuable movement. Mm-hmm. And I was just going to add that, I, and I don't know what year this happened, but things in the 70s weren't really designed to be replaced right away. And I think in the 80s, that's when stuff started to change. And maybe by the 90s, you know, that was already in effect. And obviously now they design our phones, you know, you to want the new phone every year and laptops, you know, in a, every few years kind of thing. And I think that sort of changed the mindset of the designers where they cram the features in, but having replaceable parts is just not there on the list unless you're like the framework laptop. Right. And that means that like for the future, it is worrisome, like how you're ever going to get this stuff to work again. But it also means that it just like from a, a, a fun perspective of tinkering, it's hard to tinker and even people who build their own PCs with the 2024 parts, you're just installing like large constituent components. You're not really fiddling around at a, at a logic level like you were back in the 80s and in the 70s especially. And I, I think that's a, a bit of a lost art, but mm. it comes with progress and the access of the technology to everyone. So there's a give and take. To jump on that a little bit, the difference between last year's iPhone and this year's iPhone is significantly different than the difference between a VIC-20 and a Commodore 64. And I think that that process of, like, the upgrade isn't worth it. And it, like we're, I think we're we're looking at that differently, and I think that's going to hit different from a consumer standpoint. And yeah. I think we're going to see that as the this technology continues to evolve. The, you know, the companies that are selling this are going to have to do some leaps, and I think they're betting on AI. We'll see how that pans out for them. But I I think that that's that's one of the the key things that I think is different about right now in this moment versus how it might have been in the 80s and 90s, especially I, like the early to mid 80s. I agree, and I'll go so far as to say the last three or four times I've replaced my phone was not because I was wanting the upgrade. Yeah, exactly. It was because it broke. Right. <laughs> I have a Pixel 4. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny to think that in the 80s and with the 8088 and the IBM PC came out in 1981, by 1991, 10 years later, the, the PCs you could buy then yeah. were like a hundred times faster. Yeah, yeah. And think about now, your 10-year-old computer to what you can buy today, yeah, they add some more cores and the GPU is a bit better, but we're not talking order of, or two orders of magnitude faster. Like It we, still runs Linux. <laughs> <laughs> your, your 30-year-old computer can do it yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. You Gen Xers are spoiled. <laughs> you know, ultimately, I think the answer to your question is really more of a question of history, uh, of history because people use products and then they develop their own idea of how the next product should work and then they are the people who create the next products and it's also because sometimes uh, companies create products that are trying to match a certain demographic or what people have said that they want so this is a, a, uh, a not a reciprocal relationship but yeah a reciprocal relationship it's it's it evolves and so I don't even think that there is a, a direction necessarily to the design philosophy of software and 
hardware. I think it just evolves, and uh, you know, uh, I think a, a panel of history majors would probably be uh, better to ask. So, thanks again. It's three, but we started late, so we can keep going and answer our last uh, three panel three questions. I've got I've got two questions for the entire panel. Entire panel. I'll start with the interesting one first. Uh, we went over uh, uh, favorite operating system or favorite version of operating system. My question is, what's your least favorite operating system? TI ninety nine. Windows me. <laughs> I, I grew, no, it, honestly, it, it gets more hate than it really should. I, I, I partially grew up on Windows Me, but I, it's had some problems, you know. Windows 8 for me. <laughs> because, it, because you could know everything about Windows 7, Mac OS, and Linux, and still have no idea how to use Windows 8. <laughs> like how to shut the computer off? It was like it's a swipe and do this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was Windows 8 the one where they got rid of Windows Media Player? Or Windows Media, sent the media version of it? Remember believe, that? One? I believe so. Whichever one got rid of the Media Center edition, that's the one that's the worst oh, it one. It was Windows 8. Okay, yeah. Like seven worst, had it, and then that was Worst it. operating system ever. <laughs> For me, it would be Windows 11 because I'm a Mac user and Windows 11 feels like I, it's trying too much to be like a Mac and I just rather, rather use a Mac. They centered the icons on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> but you can't move the taskbar. On a Mac, you can move the taskbar. I think you can. You can't move the taskbar. On, you can. Yeah, you can move the taskbar on Windows. On, on Windows 11, you can move the taskbar? Oh. They I don't know. They added it. I, I, can't, I can't run Windows 11 because nothing I have is TPM 2.0 compatible. <laughs> okay, somebody look this up. <laughs> I think you can move it. You can move the start menu from yeah, center. Yeah, you can move the start menu over, but you can't take the taskbar and move it off to the side where it belongs. <laughs> move the monitor. I think you can... It's getting heated in here. <laughs> I'm sorry I started a thing. I apologize. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. Someone's gonna walk up and show you. Here's the task we're on the side. You you said you had a second question. Oh yeah, my second question is, uh, could you all sign my five and a quarter inch diskette? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, but not right now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> After um, the the panel. Sure. So uh, though we're still asking questions, uh, when the panel's over, a lot of our panelists here have. Uh, tables, and so you can consult the table chart and see where they'll be uh, after the panel. All right, thank you. I only signed three and a half inch uh, diskettes. <laughs> <laughs> My question is for the entire panel What is your favorite computer game, and what computer do you run it on? Oh. I was told we only have a few minutes, uh, but Choose no, it's okay. Game. Go ahead. <laughs> No, no, okay, okay. I will say I am Doom and the Doom you know, 1, 2, that kind of thing. I, going back to when multiplayer Doom was a thing and I worked in a company and we had like Pentium 100 or whatever with IPX networking and we would stay after work and play for hours and like your eyes would burn because you didn't blink. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and to this day, I have GZ Doom like on all my computers. It runs on everything, right? And Chocolate Doom. Yeah. And I will fire that up and just play through and have so much fun. Now, I have a lot of other favorites, but I won't get into it. So, yeah. I don't know if it counts as retro or vintage, but um, StarCraft remains for me a, a favorite that I still play, essentially emulating it. I mean, nowadays I play it on Linux using Wine, but like it's effectively still the exact same game as like my Windows 98 version of it. But it, it runs on almost anything if you've got the original disc, and I just, I love that we've created open open source tools to keep it like running on modern things if you've got the original hardware. It's, it's fantastic. I know this hardware is, is not really considered vintage, but I, I have a 2013 MacBook Pro and we were talking about emulation earlier. You know, I love Flash games. I use Flashpoint. Flashpoint just to play, you know, old nostalgic stuff, you know. Flashpoint is awesome. Home Star Runner. Yeah, there you go. You can watch animations. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. 
So I grew up playing all of the uh, first person shooters. I'm a Twitch gamer just by nature. So starting with Wolf 3D and all the way up. Um, but I really came into it in college because Quake 1 came out my oh, freshman Quake. year when I had access to a 10 megabit campus wide network. So there was death matches on servers throughout the campus at any time of day, all day, all night. And so Quake 1 and then Quake 2, I spent so many, I almost failed out of college because of Quake 2. <laughs> some people is drinking too much, some people is gaming too much. Drinking and gaming. <laughs> Tetris on a Game Boy. Hell yeah. That, that's a good With one. the link cable to your friend, multiplayer. It, it's just, if, when I want to relax, it's either that or like Dr. Mario, something in that kind of just hypnotize me, please. You it's never had nightmares of over prescribing medications. <laughs> I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with Wave Race 64 oh, on the Nintendo 64. For some beautiful. reason, that one just kind of stuck with me, um, and uh, I, I, that's a go-to. I always yeah. go back. Love Wave Race. Just bought that in Japan. Yeah, nice. that's a good one. Yeah. NetHack in DOS. Oh yeah, NetHack. What? I'm still playing it 35 years later. Wow. It's still good 35 years later. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Joust and Joust clones. So there's one called Glyfa for the Macintosh that I love. And oh, sure, okay. Yeah, no one's gonna say ET. <laughs> Thanks very much. You had an Atari at home, right? Yeah, we had, <laughs> I had that game. Atari. It wasn't my favorite, but we did have the. We played ET together. Well, thank you for letting me be the last person to ask a question. I wasn't going to ask this, but I've been thinking about this uh, sitting here. Uh, this question is more of a philosophical, <clears throat> philosophical question. It doesn't really relate directly to vintage computers, but to a bunch of aspects of life. And that is, when I repair something, a vintage computer, and I get the thrill of it, okay, it was junk, and now it's fixed, and the thrill of the victory there, then, then what? It goes back on the shelf, and then there's something else to fix. But it's still on the shelf, and then that's probably where it'll stay. Ooh. And then I'm working on something else, and then I fix that, and it's like, woohoo. And it goes on the shelf with the first thing. And then I got something else that's broke. This and then I fix deep. that. And, 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 and so it goes on. I know David talked about this, about uh, stuff in his house, about, you know, you didn't have enough room for all this stuff. And so now I'm looking at all this stuff going, well, I'll fix all this stuff, but it's all cool. And I don't want to get rid, rid of it. And, but it, it flows over into other aspects of life. Like my wife wants to redecorate the house all the time. She goes, oh, this room's blue. I was like, oh, no, no, no. Oh, it needs to be green now. I was like, oh, oh, we need wallpaper now. Oh, no, no. Oh, it, it, it just never ends. Uh, I'm also uh, a full-size Jeep enthusiast. So I'm all time working on my Jeep about doing different things and changing different things. And, and so this, this, this philosophical thing about uh, when's enough and when are you done and what do you do when it's done and and uh, it seems like for me it's the journey of getting to a working conclusion and and, I, and, and, and now I, I need to seek counseling or something because I don't know what to do <laughs> a, after I have this fixed this thing so, so, I don't know what this word means done yeah. like so, when is it done well, so, so for you, the journey is fixing it. For others, the journey is using it. I would suggest yeah. uh, finding local groups to donate your finished products, projects to. 100%. And, 100%. And, you, and there's nothing wrong with always wanting the fix. Uh, the fix, that sounds terrible. <laughs> fix it, fixing the system. Um, one of the thing, you know, one thing I get out of vintage uh, computing is programming. When I am programming for two or three hours straight, it's very much uh, a source of meditation for me. So we all get different things out of the hobby. See, the trick is, if once you fix something, then you have to use it a bunch so it breaks again, and then you have the joy of <laughs> refixing it. Again. I mean, obviously I fix this stuff too, so we're on the same page there, and the thrill of fixing is great, and there's always a constant stream of stuff in my house that's going back to the local community, as Jim, yeah. as Jim mentioned. Because stuff people donate to me, I, you know, I'm not going to sell it, and I, I'll fix it, made a video, and that's fun. And then I right away just turn it around to the community. Because otherwise, you'll be out of house and home. Because your, your joy of fixing has limits to the space you have, unfortunately. 100%. I had to be very uh, honest with myself to say that I'm only going to keep something. And even then, I collect way too much. But for me, I'm the same way. Right? I love the fixing. I love the, the, the doing of the project. 
and then things sit on a shelf. And I had a hard time getting rid of that until like I literally had a conversation with myself being like, well, this isn't what you enjoy. You don't enjoy having stuff on a shelf. You enjoy fixing stuff, right? And so, yeah, that's, that's tough. So now I have a, a limited, very limited space on things that I keep. And in order for me to put something into that space, I have to take something out. I have to admit, I'm, um, depend <clears throat> who comes to my house and looks at my collection, I'm either proud or I'm embarrassed. <laughs> if, if, if they're kind of a nerdy kind of fellow, I go, oh, look at all this cool stuff. And if it's like my parents, I'm like, well, you know. <laughs> I have a hard you know, rule. That could be a, a subtitle for our website. We're either proud or embarrassed. <laughs> I love it. So I have a hard rule that there's keep no more than one example of any given thing. So if you fix a second given thing, move it along. Oh, but but there's not limit you that mods. much necessarily. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there's an NTSC thing and a PAL thing, yep, yep. and you know there's one with how you differentiate. Eighty five eighty. You gotta have. I try to do the same thing too, but colors a max. After things break, I realize I need to keep second copies of things just in case I need to go back. So. Yeah, I mean, no I more than two. Two is the. Parts things are separate things. No, but working a working copy. Through the magic of buying ten of them. Yeah. For me, it's building things. I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not as much into repair, but I love building little single board computer kits. Oh, yeah. And I will buy them, and I will have a blast building them. And at the end of every one, I think, of those videos, I'm like, all right, so we're going to play with this. That, oh, no. <laughs> we're going to put it on the shelf and start a new kit. Like, yes, I, it's fine. It's okay to have a narrow interest within the hobby. It's fine to plant a garden and not eat everything in the garden either. Like, it, 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 like if you're getting something out of the gardening, that's great. And if you're getting something out of the repair, that's great. I think that's what it's all about. I think it also, my problem is less about the, the things that I collect, but the tools that I collect to repair the things. <laughs> So like I've got a wide range of interests and I'd like to do more. And for example, in one of my videos, I was like, you know what? Like I can't find this laptop case. I'm going to make a new one. So I, I like got into leather working and my wife is like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> like, so yeah, I got to be careful there. All right. Well, with that, I'm afraid we have to say, uh, we have to stop our panel and get ready for the auction, which will be in this room. Please give a big round of applause for all of our panelists here. Thank you.